at New York Toy Fair, I went stand to stand looking at a whole load of different board games. There's some real treats this year from a sneak peek look at a new 3D version of Settlers of Catan to a whole host of new board games. I hope you'll find something here for your family, but watch through the video and let me know in the comments which you think are the ones you're going to be getting. We're looking at The Crew Quest for Planet Nine. In this game, you are an astronaut. You and your crew are trying to find the alleged ninth planet in the solar system. Cooperatively, through this card game. This card game is similar to games like Hearts or Bridge. It's called a trick-taking game. It's a very classic style of game, but this is actually a cooperative game. So you're gonna to work together, and the, the game comes with a log book that's going to give you all the the missions. So you'll you'll see here rule book on the front, log book on the back, and the log book is going to give you these missions. Each of these missions takes about five minutes, and there's 50 of them. So you could go all the way through it and, and like as fast as you can, which would take a very long time. You can skip around, anything you want to do. But there's also a way to keep record. So if you want to come back to it, you could you can do that. You as a team are trying to make sure that the commander gets the six green card. So on a turn, a player is going to look at their cards and be like, all right, I'm going to play. You know what? I know that the nine is the highest card of the green cards. So there's a good chance if I play this, someone else will play the six and then I'll win. So let's try that. So I play the nine card. Next player. Next player has the four. So we don't have it yet. Next player, aha. The next player sees that the commander put out a high card. They're gonna put out the six. And then the next player is gonna put out the eight. Luckily for us, the commander won the six green card in that hand. So we as a team won. We move on to the next mission. This can get hard though, because it's not always that easy. Sometimes you have the card that you need to win, which makes it even harder. And you can't talk about it because you're in space and you can't hear each other in space. But you can communicate a little bit. And that's what these little uh, radio helmet tokens are for. Uh, these represent once per mission, you can take a card from your hand and communicate it by putting it down in front of you and using this token on top. Where you put the token matters. Put it at the top of the card, that means it's the highest card of that color in your hand. Put it at the lower part of the card, and that means it's the lowest card of that color in your hand. And the center means it's the only card of that color in your hand. It must meet one of those requirements. And this may seem abstract and, and weird, but once you and your team kind of get in a groove and you figure out how to use this communication, it's absolutely brilliant. It works so well and it creates just the right amount of tension, deduction, and problem solving. Uh, it's a really intense, really fun game. Really, really excited for this to come out in 2020. This is The Last Defense. You have 20 minutes to save the city. This game plays in 20 minutes every time. It's driven by an app component to trigger events in going to add to the game. And the music is playing and the newscasters are telling you what to do. Now the app has been designed that all we see is the countdown timer on the screen. And it doesn't require us to look back and forth at the app. All of our focus as a family is on the board and on each other. So we start here in the center of town square. And the setup for the game is that monsters have overrun our town and the first responders are completely overwhelmed. They're calling on your family to be the last line of defense. It's cooperative and it's going to play in 20 minutes. So here we go. On my turn, I'm going to roll the dice to move around the board. I got two movement and I get one extra tool. I'm playing as dad, barbecue dad, and he's gonna head this way towards the office. He's trying to clear rubble from around the city and he's gonna need tools to pick things, to pick up the rubble and rescue the scientists underneath. Binoculars and a med kit, if I could turn those in, I could clear that rubble and underneath is an engineer. These scientists are gonna be used to overcome obstacles in this case, the junk blob is terrorizing our town right now. I need a biologist and a meteorologist to get rid of him. But as the game progresses, more and more threats are going to come out onto the board, and the app is going to tell us where they're placed.
our weather copter has spotted what appears to be spider robots at the neighborhood. I repeat, we have sightings of spider robots at the neighborhood. So we're going to pass the dice around the board really fast, trying to overcome obstacles, and the device is going to be telling us who's moving where, and we're getting pushed back, and we're trying to rescue and save we our city our in 20 minutes. That's the last this defense. Important news. We have reports around the city of damage caused by unknown monsters. We have people trapped at these locations. The so with Mystery House, you're going to use a companion mobile app to uh, walk through a situation that uh, you're going to have to solve. Uh, in this one, you get a phone call uh, saying that there's a bomb that's going to go off in a bank that's going to blow a vault door open and have uh, people run away with all the money. Uh, so now you can see inside the insert, we've got the outside of a bank. We're going to have to interact with the app and what we see on this house here to try to find clues, make our way into the bank, and uh, defuse this bomb before it goes off. Uh, if you see something you want to interact with, you would just look at the corresponding card uh, and then you will choose the item on the list that you want to interact with. So on S5, for example, I saw a purse outside the building. So if I clicked on bag, now it instructs me to take object number three, which is an identification card for the building. And there also might be clues uh, on the badge itself as well that you could look at. On card C2, you can actually see a key hanging from a, a little AC unit in there. So if I choose C2 on the app, select key, now I've found a key uh, that is in my possession as well. Uh, so now I've got a couple of different ways to possibly open one of these doors. Uh, to look at those, I'm going to try the door on L5. That one kind of looks like it would use a key to unlock. I can use the app to confirm on L5 that the changing room door is key locked. And then I can go back to L5 and choose to interact and use my key and the app tells me that I've opened that door. It now instructs you to discard uh, the key and then lift up the card so now we can see inside the room itself. Uh, now we've got a whole bunch of more stuff to interact with potentially and you've got to just keep opening more doors, uh, finding more items to eventually solve the scenario. And that's Mystery House. So this is uh, the U.S. premiere of a prototype of a 3D edition Catan board. It features everything you have in a regular Catan board, all the, all the terrain of forests and pastures, ore mountains, the desert, grain fields, and uh, brick hills. Um, obviously it has a, a sea surrounding a frame and each of the ports has a little ship that is your two for one trading port or your three for one trading port. The playing pieces are 3D pieces, they're, they're not final. These are pieces that are used in um, some editions around the world, not in English. Well, a lot of people have asked for a 3D board to really celebrate uh, Catan 25th anniversary, but also just to give them something to really touch and feel and hang on to and really feel like you're on the island. And so that is the exclusive first look in the U.S. at this 3D Catan set. All right, so this is Miyabi, designed by Michael Kiesling. It's for two to four players, ages eight and up. And in the game, each player is building their own Japanese garden. So on a player's turn, they will pick one of the available tiles out. We're halfway through a round right now in this demo, but you have the tiles in the center, you pick one of the tiles. There's very easy, straightforward placement rules. The objects on the tile must always go in the row that has that same object type. So I could go like that, um, because that's the correct object type. And in addition, you can only put objects in a column you haven't used yet this round, so that's all right. But now I would light this lantern to indicate that I've used this column, so I can't use this column again this round. If alternatively I wanted to play the tile on top to help build up, like in this situation, I could do that. But when you build on top of other tiles, you need to make sure that the tile you're putting on top is fully supported. Either way though, once you place the tile, you'll score points equal to the number of objects on the tile, which is also the size of the tile, multiplied by the level you put it on. So in that situation, I would have gotten three points for putting the size three tile on level one. 
If I had built it up, I would have gotten six points. So, and third level would have been nine points. You, you see how we're going here. <laughs> So it's very straightforward. There's a few other ways to score points in the game. So there's Miyabi, available now from Haba. So this is Starlink. It's a drawing party game for three to six players, ages eight and up, and it takes about 30 minutes to play. So in Starlink, what we are doing is making links between these stars to try to represent one of the uh, words on our card. We, we are Delta card. We get to choose which one. I might go for the magic wand. I think that seems easier. I do not reveal this to other players. Start the timer. Start drawing. The only thing I can do is uh, connect uh, straight lines between the stars. So I'm going to go for something like this, maybe. And hopefully the other players are going to be able to guess what that is. If they do, uh, it was a magic wand, I believe. Yeah. Uh, if they guess it correctly, we will both score points and we will get a bonus point if it is able to fit within this telescope, which unfortunately this drawing is not. Uh, we keep going like that, taking turns as the um, star linker. Uh, once we've gone twice, the game is over and um, most points win. All right, so this is Valley of the Vikings, designed by Wilfred and Marie Force. Uh, it won the 2019 Kinderspiel des Jahres, and it is about the annual Viking bowling competition. So in this game, each player is on a Viking team. So you'll pick a color that you want to be on the team of. And on your turn, you're going to go ahead and bowl using the batter, trying to knock down barrels. When you knock down barrels, those are the, team, those are the teams you move along the deck or the dock. Um, and the colors that you knock down, those are the only ones you can move, but you get to decide how you move them and order matters. So for example, I get to move blue and red. If I moved blue first, they would go here and then red would go here. However, if I moved red first, red would go here and then blue would end up in the water, triggering a scoring round. When a scoring round is triggered, everyone that is still on the dock will earn coins for where they are along the dock. And if you're on another player's flag, you steal from that other player. But if you're on your own, you steal a coin from every other player. The goal of the game is to have the most coins at the end, and the game will end when all the gold coins run out. The game is for two to four players, and when you play with less than four players, you always include all ships. It's for ages six and up, and it's available now from Haba. So this is Dragon's Breath and Dragon's Breath The Hatching. Both these games are designed by Lena and Glinta Bunkat, and they are two separate games. The new one this year would be Dragon's Breath The Hatching. The original Dragon's Breath won the Kenner Spiel des Jahres in 2018, and so we've introduced this new standalone expansion that you can play by itself or in com combination with the original Dragon's Breath. So, in the new version, you still have the nest with the frozen crystals inside of it that you're melting. And on a player's turn as the Dragon Mom, Dragon Mom will go ahead and melt the ice, removing the top ring, but trying to be careful so that the egg doesn't fall. Then the Dragon Children will take turns picking gemstones to put on their amulets, trying to complete the amulets to score points. But Dragon Mom still has her turn to draft. Dragon Mom would then continue melting the ice and, oh, oh no, it fell. <laughs> if the egg falls, Dragon Mom go at, goes ahead, is very ashamed of being a bad dragon mother and <laughs> tucks into there. So now um, when it comes back around to Dragon Mom's turn to pick gemstones, instead of selecting two gemstones, they'll just select one. So that's how you play the game. Um, each player will have a chance to play Dragon Mom, pulling all three rings off and selecting gemstones. Um, and once every player has had a chance to be Dragon Mom, the player who has the most points and completed annuals wins the game. The game is for two to four players, ages six and up, and is available now from Haba. So this is Fish Club. This is the next generation of Connect Four. It actually is coming from the son of the original, one of the two original inventors of Connect Four. In this game, what we're trying to do is link five of our fish together by dropping them into this aquarium. So a two player game for ages five and up, takes a few minutes to play. We just take turns adding one of our pieces to the aquarium. And as we add them, they're gonna start bouncing around and 
Hopefully what we're able to do is make a group of them or a school of fish. Uh, but we also have the option of adding blocking pieces. These are not in any player's color and they can be used to separate uh, one of your, your opponent's group. Keep taking turns until one player gets five in a row. That player is the winner. And then just play again. I'm going to go for a block. And the win. And that is Fish Club. So this is Cupcake Academy. This is a cooperative speed logic game for two to four players, ages eight and up. And each round takes seven minutes to play. So in Cupcake Academy, each player begins with a stack of five cupcake cups upside down on one of their plates. We have three plates, five cupcake cups stacked on top of each other, and we want to make our cupcake cups match the challenge card. And the only way we can do that is by moving one cup at a time between either our plates or the central plate. I'm not allowed to move my opponent's cups. They're going to have to move it to the central plate before I can take it. So in this case, the, this player was going to need to have both pink cups, so I would need to pass this there, they would pass that there, and we keep moving cups until these cups match these cups, at which point we would go on to the next challenge. We try to complete as many as we can within a seven minute timer. There is a um, achievement card here, so the more challenges you're able to complete, the better you do, and some extra challenges of using your less dominant hand or not speaking during this. And that's Cupcake Academy. All right, so this is Oceans, and it is the next game in the, in the Evolution series where you are creating an oceanic ecosystem. You're adapting species to the changing environment, and the act of adapting changes the environment. So on your turn, if you play, let's say, the Apex Predator card, all of a sudden there's a predator on the board, and other people are, are going to be playing defensive traits to protect themselves. And then uh, the Apex Predator doesn't have any food anymore because it can't get to the food, so then it has to adapt. And so there's this continual adapting to the changing environment in a regular kind of survival of the fittest model. And the game is called Oceans, and uh, it has one deck of cards which creates like a surf, an oceanic ecosystem. And it was, uh, we had a, uh, a designer who's a professor of marine biology. And then we have another deck of cards called The Deep, and it's a hundred unique powerful cards and that represents the unknown. And you never know what powerful, crazy thing you might find in the unknown. Yeah, so a typical turn is you have a hand of cards and you're gonna play one trait on a species to adapt it. And in this case now, the Apex Predator has speed and is faster, able to get away from other predators better and can attack better. Um, then you're gonna feed one of your species. And some species can feed in the reef here and some species feed on the other species around the reef. And basically, every these little, these little cute fish, their population. And so this species has one, two, three, four, five, six, population of six. And every single one of these fish that you have at the end of the game are points. So you basically want your species to thrive. And so this game has been featured in Science News, uh, Science Magazine. Uh, the original game, Evolution, in the series is used at the University of Oxford in the Evolutionary Biology Department and, um, and was featured in the journal Nature. And so it's, uh, it's got a really good science pedigree and a lot of people are using it in educational uh, facilities. And that's Oceans. You are the station master and it's your job to make sure that your passengers make their train and that the trains actually leave the station on time. If you do that and are the most efficient in making sure that those trains leave and that the passengers are on the right train, you're going to get credit for that in efficiencies. On your turn, you can play one of your three cards on the train, right? Or you can put a passenger on the train on the locomotive. You get to do one of those two things. You don't get to do both. The locomotives themselves have a number up in the corner, a blue number, that will tell you two different things. It will tell you how many rail cars need to be on the train before the train leaves the station. So this particular locomotive needs three rail cars, okay? It also tells you how many passenger tokens can live on that train. So this particular train can have three rail cars and three passenger tokens. So the train right now is completely full. 
we actually have two different rail cars and when it's Andy's turn, when he actually goes in place, he's going to send the train off. So when the train leaves, then we're going to score this particular train. Okay, and the train is scored by adding up the sum of the rail cars and then multiplying it by the value of your passengers. Now the passengers themselves will be a value of a negative one all the way up to a positive three. When you play your passenger, your opponents don't know what your actual passenger value is. And so it's not until the passengers are, are, are actually revealed that everybody goes, oh, wait a second, this is what's going on, right? It's Andy's turn. And so he's gonna play a card onto the number three train right here. So in this particular case, the train is now leaving the station. So we're gonna add up the value of the rail cars. So we have eight minus two because this is a negative, right? So the train is actually worth a negative six points. Okay, so we're gonna, uh-oh, Andy has a negative one, right? And I'm actually sitting with a positive three. So we're gonna take those negative six, I'm at a, a minus 18, where Andy gets positive six points. So this train is gonna leave the station, and then we're actually gonna score the train, and the train, uh, the game comes with an app, it's free to download, right? And all you're going to do is actually push the button that matches the locomotive. And then you're going to put the actual cars that are on there, the values of the cars. And that will bring you to the actual players. And so Andy's the, the cap there, and he had a negative one. And I'm actually playing the, the books, right? And I had a positive three, right? And so we're going to score the train and then the app actually gives you the total score. And when you're done there, it'll give you a running board so you can see what the actual score of the game is. So this game was actually in play, so I'm actually a little bit ahead of Andy right now, which is really good. The game continues until all the locomotives have left the station and the player with the highest score is gonna win. Now the really cool thing about the game is this is a game that has a lot of uh, high player interaction. And so what you're gonna be doing is playing cards that are gonna mess with your opponent. So you're gonna be transferring them from one, one train to another, or you're gonna be making a train leave, or try to be making it into a negative value. And at the same time, trying to get yourself set up to where you're scoring the most. And so that's Station Master. Lots of fun. I, uh, I, I hope you enjoy poking your friend and uh, riding the rails with Station Master. All right, this is Back to the Future Dice Through Time, designed by Chris Leader, Kevin Rogers, and Ken Franklin. In this game, the idea is that Biff did far more damage than we thought when he stole the DeLorean in the second movie. And now it's up to you, teams of Doc and Marty, to take jump in your DeLoreans and re repair the space-time continuum. We're going to be doing that by rolling your dice each round. These icons will tell you what you can do. We'll be going around resolving different events and returning items to their proper place and time. Along the way, if you have a die you're not going to use, you can leave it in the past to ripple forward to locations in the future, just like they left letters to each other in a trilogy. Biff will be causing trouble, you can move him away with a fist die, and of course everyone gets their own little DeLoreans to move around. The idea is to return all of the items to their proper place and time before the out of time tracker reaches game over. So on your turn, each player will roll a handful of dice, and different dice will let you do different things, so Doc, of course, can help you resolve paradoxes, flux capacitors will let you travel through time, fists will move Biff, and this lets you um, re-roll any unspent dice. So if I am the blue DeLorean here on the board, for example, and I want to solve this event, I could go ahead and use this rippled die from the clock tower in the past to move Biff over to the side. And then I could also use my die here to resolve this event. And this is great because it also gets rid of this paradox token, which will further repair the space-time continuum. When I do that, I would move the out-of-time tracker down. I would also get an event that I would then have to return to its proper place and time. So I would get the hoverboard that I would then have to return to Clock Tower Mall 
in 2015. This is Back to the Future, Dice Through Time, available from Target in June 2020. Great, hi, I'm Jason from Game Riot, and this is Abandon All Autochokes. It's a heartless card game for two to four players ages 10 and up. And the object of the game, it's the name of the game, is to abandon all your artichokes. At the beginning of the game, you're dealt out 10 of these prickly produce, all different faces on it, but they're all artichokes. And you are trying to, over the course of the game, reconstruct your deck so that you get some of these great veggies, some potatoes or onions or peas, more onions there. So the way it plays out is that at the beginning of your turn, you're gonna draw five cards from your personal hand. At the beginning of the game, they are all artichokes. You're gonna harvest a card that is not an artichoke from the garden, for example, this onion, and then you're gonna take any action associated with this. For example, this onion says, compost an artichoke. Well, composting is good because that means you get rid of the artichoke for the rest of the game. So I'm gonna put this in my discard pile, then I get to put the, this particular artichoke in the compost pile over here, and it's gone. Goodbye, artichoke. Don't wanna see you anymore. I don't have any more actions to do on my turn, so I discard the rest of my hand. I draw back up to five cards, and then the next player takes their turn. So over the game, you're going to be replenishing the garden, drawing new cards into your hand, putting them, uh, taking their actions, and then hopefully getting that lucky streak that when you discard your hand and draw back up to five cards from your deck, you get, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, no artichokes, and you say abandon all artichokes and you win the game. That's your m lucky magical moment right there. Draw a five card hand with no artichokes and you are the winner of abandon all artichokes. This game is called Dungeon Drop. Instant dungeon, infinite possibilities. You are making a dungeon out of these cool colorful cubes that come in all kinds of varieties. You've got gold of course down in your dungeon, you've got different kinds of gems, you've got also some bad creatures like some goblins and some trolls and the mighty dragon all represented by different shape, different size cubes. The object of the game is to collect as many of these cubes as possible according to your particular quest. So I've got this Fool's Folly quest, and so for me, cube, the blue cubes are worth three, the clear ones are worth two, and the pink ones are worth one point, and then chests, which are not on the board yet, are they score three points each. So on my turn, I'm gonna reach into this box, I'm gonna drop some more loot into the dungeon. There I go, and the second part of my turn is I'm gonna invoke one of my two abilities. So for example, I'm a half orc rope master which has some unique powers on them. This I could flick one monster, so I can take a monster and flick it to a different location like this. Oops, that's too far, went too long. Or um, that you can do other actions like removing cubes out of the game to get additional powers. But ultimately, where the magic of the game is, is that you want to triangulate a dungeon room with these silver cubes. The silver cubes, two of them make a wall, but three of them make a room, and you get to collect all of the loot that's in the middle of the room and you add it to your personal pile. And the goal is, over three rounds, collect the best loot that matches your quest, get some gold, get some treasure chests which come out, and of course unlock them with a key. The treasure chests are unique because they have variable uh, score depending on how you roll them at the end of the game. And then the combination of all those three which makes your score at the end. So a completely different gamescape. It's not a card game, it's not a board game, it's really a tabletop game with these bits. It's a really a revolutionary style board game. And that's Dungeon Drop. Two to four players, ages eight and up from Game Right. Hi there, I'm Andy Looney from Looney Labs, inventor of Flux, but also the creator of the Looney Pyramid Game System, which we see set out before us. It's all about these pyramids, which come in three sizes and lots of colors and are useful for many different board games. We have a comprehensive library of games we published about four years ago called Pyramid Arcade. And that includes everything you need to play 22 amazingly different games using these pyramids. And it comes with a comprehensive rule book that explains how all of these games work. But this game system is so big and comprehensive, it's kind of daunting. So this summer we're releasing a new series of standalone little games, which focus on each of several different hits for the game. Some of the best games that we've developed over the last 25 years we're showcasing as their own versions, starting with Nomads, which is actually brand new, but which is a perfect building block set, and then working its way up in complexity, because that one's very easy. It's a luck game that a lot of people can play, but Ice Duo is a little more complicated. In fact, it's two games in one. One that's a, a luck game, a pressure luck game, and one that's got hidden information where you're trying to to build a certain pattern without people knowing which one you're doing. 
And then you got Martian chess, which is a little more complicated still because it's pure strategy, no luck, but it's got all the same color pieces and a real hook for knowing how you, which pieces are yours and how you get to control them. And then the most amazing game of all, Homeworlds, an epic interstellar space battle game played just with these colorful pyramids that rivals chess for its depth of strategic fascination. And the thing is, I love Homeworld so much, I will actually give you a medal if you can beat me. See, it looks like this. It's a beautiful medal. On the back it says, I beat Andy Looney in a game of Homeworlds. Because this game is so challenging to learn that I'm trying to create what I call a gunslinger culture in which people will learn this game, get good at it, and then seek me out at a convention and challenge me to this game. Only 19 of these have been awarded so far. Maybe you'll get the 20th. And all of these games we call Looney Pyramid games, and they're sold by Looney Labs. This is Animix. This is a card game for two to six players ages eight and up, and takes about 10 minutes to play. So in this game, we are trying to score the right mix of animals to get the most points. Each game, we're gonna choose which animals we're playing with based on the numbers of players and what we feel like that game. Once we've chosen our animals, we shuffle them all together, deal out a number in the middle here, face up, based again on the number of players, and then deal six face down to each player. These animals will start in your hand, and each turn, you'll play one of them onto the table. Your objective is to have the most of an animal type in front of you at the end of the game. If you have the most of an animal in your own personal scoring area, you will score its points in the middle grid here. And each animal is worth a different, or uh, scores points in a different way. For example, these wolves are gonna score points if they're on the outside border. So each wolf on the outside border scores two, four, six, eight points right now for the player who has the most wolves at the end of the game. Monkeys in a uh, vertical line, uh, elephants in the horizontal line, penguins in a orthogonally connected uh, group, and then um, pelicans in sort of the opposite in a diagonally connected group. So the way you play cards is each turn you're gonna choose one from your hand and you're either gonna play it face down in front of you, which just is gonna try to score that animal for you at the end of the game, or you can try to manipulate the animals in the middle here by playing your card to replace another animal. So if I was trying to get these elephants, I might wanna make a bigger line here, but that's gonna score the wolves for me. So at the end of the game, we're gonna have six animals in front of us. We're gonna see who has the most of them, and then we'll figure out how many points they're worth. Most points is the winner, and that's Animix. Hi, Andy, thank you for having me back. Um, today, we're gonna to talk about mass transit here at Toy Fair. Uh, this is a brand new game that we're gonna be coming out in uh, probably mid to late August. Uh, mass transit is a game where we are actually working for the government. And um, as government workers, we are gonna be building transit systems to get workers home from the city back out to the suburbs. So the objective of the game is we have six workers that we have to get home by three different modes of transportation. Um, we have railroads, we have ferries, and then we also have buses. You also have one other mode of transportation, which is walking. And walking is this little guy over here. When you're coming out of the city, you must actually walk to the first station. So if my worker is here, I must play a walk card that has the green icon to get him to the station, okay? So the cards themselves can be used as two different mediums. One is to actually transport the different meeples. The other one is to build the route home. So you're going to play it either as a movement card or you're going to play it as part of the route. So in this game here, we've got this all set up and it's actually my turn. Um, at the beginning of the game, players are dealt three cards or four cards, I'm sorry and they can play anywhere from a minimum of two. You have to play two cards, right? But you can play all the way up to four, and then you're gonna draw your hand back up. Now, this is a cooperative game, so it's either everybody wins or everybody loses. You are working for the city, right? And there's a lot of red tape. And so you can't talk to your other 
co-conspirators, if you will. In this current instance, it is now my turn. Um, when I have a card that I need to play for movement, I look at the card for the movement icon on the top. That's gonna allow me to move from this stop sign to this train station. So that's one card that I'm, I'm gonna play. Now, I also have a card in my hand that has an exclamation point on it. That means I have to play the card before my turn is over, okay? So I'm gonna play that card right now. Um, I'm, I'm gonna discard it, right? And when I play it, I'm, again, I'm playing for movement, and so I'm gonna move this meeple to this stop sign, okay? Now that's as far as he could go in that instance. But I just so happen to have another card in my hand that allows me to take him all the way home. From, so it's gonna go from the stop sign all the way to the house, right? So we've successfully gotten that gentleman home. And at this particular point in time, it becomes Andy's turn. Now, we have successfully achieved getting five of the six meeples home. We only have one additional route left to go, and that's the ferry route. And we have, we have here one, two, three, four cards in play. Andy has in his hand the card that we need to cap off that route, All right? So that is the end of the suburb, the end of the line. We know that the, there's a four here, and that four tells us the number of cards that need to be in the line between the city and the suburb. Now, Andy must play two cards from his hand. However, at this particular point, all the cities have been kept, or all the suburbs are kept. There's nowhere for him to play additional transit cards to, ext to extend the, the, the railway or the waterway or the, the roads. So the only option we have is to get this guy home, but his hand does not allow him the movement that we need to win successfully. And Andy, this is all your fault. Why didn't we win? Why didn't you do that for me? But you're a great city planner. We were almost made it. We were almost there. And we appreciate you giving us that opportunity. Thank you.